Today's podcast is brought to you by Hypervape. Hypervape.com. Sleek, discreet, and reliable. That's H Y P R V A P E. Hypervape.com. Welcome to the Drift and Ramble podcast. I'm Steve Blizzen. Each episode will explore true stories and American legends. From the pages of history and a few stories handed down over the years, we'll look at the people, places, and events that helped shape a nation. Stories of survival, notable frontier men and women, explorers who struck it rich, and the outlaws that stole it from them. There'll be studies of saloon girls, swindlers, banditry, and bad men, profiles of lawmen and American Indians, and the good and evil that existed between them. We'll amble through the past, we'll delve into the folklore of the times, and maybe even uncover a ghost story or two. So, saddle up, or settle in, for the Drift and Ramble podcast. This is episode 15. In 1931, a man named Stuart Lake released a biography on the now famous Western lawman Wyatt Earp. The book became a bestseller. The trouble is, much of what the book contained was manipulated by people with various motives for making the book more of a work of fiction than the biography it claims to be. This isn't meant to discredit Mr. Lake or Mr. Earp. It's just that in the days of the Old West, legends were easily crafted by men who put themselves on the front lines of history, and many of the stories recounted as fact by Mr. Earp himself may have been exaggerations or completely devoid of fact. Wyatt Earp's famous friend, Doc Holliday, was renowned for being the source of his own bloody reputation, and it wouldn't be much of a leap to assume that, in seeing the benefit of such public relations, Earp simply followed suit. So how can we know the truth? The trail has grown cold. Time has turned to dust many truths. And what remains cannot easily be fitted back into a cohesive tale. But the true story of Wyatt Earp is no less wild than if he were here to tell it to us again today. Wyatt Barry Stapp Earp was born in the town of Monmouth, Illinois on March 19, 1848, His father, Nicholas, named him after his commanding officer during the Mexican War, Wyatt Barry Stapp. He was the third son born to the Earp family. His older brothers, James and Virgil, were both born in Kentucky. The family moved to Pella, Iowa shortly after Wyatt's birth, where his father had received a 160-acre land grant because of his service in the Mexican War. It was here where his two younger brothers, Morgan and Warren, were born. Wyatt also had two sisters and two half-siblings, an older half-brother named Newton and a half-sister from his father's first marriage. She wasn't even one year old before she died, however. Martha, who was two years older than Wyatt, only lived to be ten years old. Adelia, who was younger than Wyatt, was born in 1861. James and Virgil served in the Civil War and returned to the family home in 1864. Soon after, the family moved to California. Along the way, they had a little trouble with Indians. In an excerpt attributed to Nicholas Earp, Wyatt's father, from author and historian Steve Gatto's book, The Real Wyatt Earp, Wyatt's father recounts an encounter with hostile Indians on the way. We gathered the guns and rushed to meet the Indians. When they got as close as we intended them to come, we commences to popping away at them and soon succeeded in checking them and putting them to flight. They ran off about a half mile and stopped and turned around as though they were not satisfied. I said, boys, they are not satisfied. Let's satisfy them. So I ran to the wagons and jumped on a horse and said, We'll make them leave here. Dr. Rusal, T.J. Ellis, James Earp, and a young man named Tucker that was with the Hamiltons 
and two other men that got in with us followed suit and we charged off after the Indians. Wyatt would have been about 16 at the time, though no mention of him is made. The family arrived in San Bernardino, California, and the next year, Wyatt says he drove wagons to Arizona, Salt Lake City, Utah, and Julesburg, Colorado. By 1869, the family had moved to Lamar, Missouri. It was here where Wyatt would begin his career in law enforcement. His father had become town constable for Lamar, and he resigned from the position on November 17, 1869. Nicholas Earp was appointed Justice of the Peace, and Wyatt, now 21, would become town constable. As a young lawman in Missouri, not much was documented about Earp. But one article from the Southwest Missourian from June of 1870 mentions the lawman showing a certain flair for keeping the peace. Come to grief. One of our citizens had a brother from a distance call to see him on Monday last. And not seeing each other for a long time, they started around town to have a good time generally. Taking aboard a good supply of 40 rod, they wandered around until the evening when Constable Earp found one of them on the street incapable of taking care of himself and took him down to a stone building which he has appropriated for use for just such customers. As Earp was about turning the key upon his bird, the other came staggering up inquiring for his brother. Mr. Earp opened the door and slid him in. Coming up to the square, Mr. Earp met another hard case in the shape of a tramping butcher who asked Mr. Earp to purchase him a pencil in place of one he alleged Mr. Earp had borrowed of him some time previous. Mr. Earp enticed him down to the stone building to procure him a pencil, and of course he shared the fate of the other two. There being a hole in the roof of the building, the three caged birds managed to crawl out before morning, and the stranger, not liking the reception he met here, left for parts unknown. The other two were brought before Esquire Earp and fined five dollars in costs each. A few more examples, and the town will be better for it. Wyatt married 20-year-old Eurilla Sutherland in 1869. He paid fifty dollars for a lot on the outskirts of town and built a modest house for his pregnant wife. But before the child could be born, she contracted typhoid fever and died in 1870. Wyatt's life began to spiral into a blur of troubled times. As constable of Lamar, Wyatt was also a tax collector, as was true for many law enforcement positions in the Old West. But just like many others of that time, Wyatt didn't always turn over the money he collected, and that resulted in a lawsuit filed against him in Barton County for failing to turn over the fees he had collected. Then, he was accused of horse thievery in April of 1871, he, Ed Kennedy, and John Schoen were accused of horse thievery. Two horses were reportedly stolen from John Keyes, and Marshal J.G. Owens took Wyatt in for the crime. Wyatt was arrested and taken into custody on April 6th of 1871. Bond was set at $500, and Earp remained in jail until May, when he escaped. Earp crawled through the roof of his jail cell, and he hightailed it out of town. A warrant was issued for his arrest, but by November, it was returned unserved. Although he was never tried for the charge of horse theft, his co-defendant, Ed Kennedy, was acquitted of the charges. Anna Schoen, the wife of the third man involved, made a sworn statement that Earp and Kennedy had forced her husband to take part in the thefts. We can't know all the facts surrounding the Arkansas horse theft, but the evidence doesn't jive with the gleaming badge of justice narrative that Wyatt himself may have told his biographer, Stuart Lake. The paper trail, however, cannot be denied. Stuart Lake interviewed Earp on several occasions, but by then, Earp was in his 80s, and his recollections may have been slightly skewed. 
Earp claimed to be hunting buffalo on the Great Plains from 1871 to 1872. But court records and the city directory from Peoria, Illinois, place Earp as a resident of Peoria during that time, and more specifically, living with a woman named Jane Haspel, who operated a brothel. In February of 1872, police raided the residence and arrested four women and three men. Among the men were Wyatt Earp, his brother Morgan, and a man named George Randall. They were all charged with keeping and being found in a house of ill fame. Wyatt was arrested again in May, and yet again in September of 1872, for the same crime. This time, the Peoria Daily National Democrat reports that Wyatt had been arrested in September aboard a floating brothel he owned named the Beardstown Gunboat. The woman with him was named Sally Heckle, who claimed she was Wyatt Earp's wife. The paper stated, Some of the women are said to be good-looking, but all appear to be terribly depraved. John Walton, the skipper of the boat, and Wyatt Earp, the Peoria bummer, were each fined $43.15. Sarah Earp, alias Sally Heckle, calls herself the wife of Wyatt Earp. In those days, the term bummer was an insult of the highest order. This put Wyatt Earp in the lowest class of beggars, scoundrels, and lazabouts who were chronic lawbreakers. So it seems the gleaming badge of justice had blinded Stuart Lake to some facts about Wyatt Earp. Wyatt himself may not have wanted to share the unsavory parts of his history with his biographer, but truth always has a way of leaking out. Maybe Earp did hunt buffalo for a time, as he had mentioned. Or maybe the term buffalo was being used in the meaning and spirit of the times. In the days of the Old West, to buffalo someone was to catch them off guard and knock them out cold. Maybe Earp wanted Stuart Lake to paint a romantic, poetic picture of a frontier lawman and not some pimp from Peoria. Wyatt's name turned up again in arrest records in 1874. This time he was in Wichita, Kansas, where he operated a brothel with the prostitute named Sally Earp, still claiming to be his wife. Wyatt reportedly operated the brothel with his brother James' wife, according to historian Tom Correa in an article titled Old West Wyatt Earp. Was he pimpin'? Though a few writers have tried to justify Wyatt Earp's involvement with prostitution by saying he was merely a bouncer, there is some certainty that he was involved with the house of ill repute during that same time when he was alleged to have been on the police force. The paper trail, however, paints a different tale. In 1874, he worked as a private officer to collect a debt for a brief period. Then, in 1875, he was appointed to the Wichita police force at a salary of $60 a month. Shortly thereafter, the papers were reporting on his exploits, but not all of the press was good. On January 12, 1876, the Wichita Beacon reported that Earp had just a few days earlier, on January 9th, had a little mishap with his six-gun when it somehow slipped from his holster, hit the ground, and fired accidentally. Oops! Fortunately, nobody was hurt. Perhaps Earp's past, his known association with prostitutes, and his refusal to back down from a fight all conspired against him in Wichita. As the town elections were gearing up, Earp got into a fight with the man running against his boss, and the resulting controversy cost Earp his job. Not only was Earp voted out of office, but his wages were withheld in an effort to pay back money he had collected but failed to turn over to the city treasurer the exact same charge that had been brought against him five years prior by Barton County. It seems that lawman Wyatt Earp had some difficulty straddling that thin blue line. Wyatt officially left the police force in Wichita in April of 1876, and by May of that same year, he turned up again in Dodge City. The Wichita Beacon reported that Wyatt Earp had joined the police force in Dodge, and he remained on the force until at least March of 1877. 
During this time, Wyatt met two people who would figure prominently in Earp's life and in the history of the Old West. One was named Doc Holliday, and the other was named Bat Masterson. Holliday's friendship with Earp is well known, but Masterson and Earp would also remain close for years, and they worked together on numerous occasions as lawmen, hired guns, and faro dealers. You can learn more about Doc Holliday, Bat Masterson, and Wyatt Earp's time in Dodge City in Episodes 12 and 14 of the Drift and Ramble podcast. You can also hear from the man himself, as Bat Masterson recollects his times with Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday in special episodes you can only access when you become a Patreon supporter of this podcast. Details can be found at patreon.com slash driftandramble or at driftandramble.com. Bat Masterson wrote about Wyatt Earp in 1907 for a magazine called Human Life. In the article, Masterson credits Wyatt Earp with shooting a cowboy off his horse and killing him. As the story goes, Wyatt went to investigate a man shooting into the walls of a vaudeville house where a comedian was performing. Masterson also wrote about that now infamous day in Tombstone where the shooting near the O.K. Corral took place. There is no doubt the Earps, Masterson, and Holliday all knew each other well. The men rode together on numerous occasions while in Dodge and in Texas, but contrary to many a tale written about Wyatt Earp, he was not widely known. Like his friend Doc Holliday, Wyatt Earp himself was largely responsible for the legendary reputation he was alleged to have earned as a lawman. Dodge City, by this time, was beginning to wind down from its heyday as a boom town. The gold finds nearby had run their course, and the money and opportunity soon began to drain from the town. As the action slowed in Dodge, Virgil Earp wrote Wyatt about the news of a silver find in Tombstone, and soon Wyatt Earp, Doc Holliday, and his common-law bride, known as Big Nose Kate, were making their way to Arizona. So how did one little shootout become the most well-known gun battle of the Old West? Perhaps the answer lies in the events that followed many years after the smoke of the gun battle had cleared. But when we dig back through time, into the facts leading up to the gunfight, the picture only gets more cloudy. The Cochise County Cowboys, as they were known, were a group of rowdy cattle rustlers and outlaws with little regard for laws, lawmen, government, or politics. They stole, robbed, or rustled cattle near the Mexican border, then sold the goods in town, spending freely with their ill-gotten gains. The crimes were not often considered to have occurred on American soil or against American citizens, so no real effort was made to quell the criminal activity. In fact, some local businesses actually profited from the money these cowboys brought in. But for most law-abiding citizens, the Cochise County cowboys were nothing but trouble. The trouble first started brewing over some stolen government mules. The theft of these mules was a federal offense, and it escalated into a volley of threats and hard feelings that played out in the local press. Part of the problem was that in the years following the Civil War, there were still many hard feelings over what was perceived as northern influence in the government. The cowboys, as well as many of the townsfolk, were mostly comprised of southern sympathizers. These wounds still seemed fresh after nearly 20 years since the end of the Civil War. Captain Hurst of the U.S. Army and Wyatt Earp came to collect the stolen mules. After a hailstorm of insults and threats, the cowboys eventually agreed to return the stolen mules. But when the time came and the mules did not arrive, the cowboys showed up to make fools of Wyatt and Captain Hurst, who had come to collect them. The cowboys laughed at and taunted the men, then threatened their lives to boot. The primary figures in the Cochise County Cowboys were Ike, Billy, and Finn Clanton, Tom and Frank McLowry, William Curly Bill Brocious, Buckskin Frank Leslie, Johnny Ringo, and Pony Deal, though others rode with the men from time to time. 
They received favorable support from people like Oriental Saloon owner Milt Joyce and Sheriff Johnny Behan, who seemed to be either afraid of, or in cahoots with, this unruly band of men. Even one local tombstone newspaper called The Nugget seemed to favor the cowboys in the press. Though the Earps expressed concern about the cowboy crime wave to then-County Sheriff Johnny Behan, he showed very little interest in the Earps' complaints. The rowdy cowboys continued their antics unabated. One night, during a late-night fracas in which five of the cowboys were literally shooting at the moon, the town marshal, Frank White, was shot, albeit accidentally. The marshal was shot in the groin while trying to disarm the revelers. The man responsible for the shot that killed Marshal White was Curly Bill Brocious. The shot didn't kill White right away, but he died as a result of the wound within days. Everyone claimed to believe that the shooting was accidental, including Marshal White himself before he died. Still, White's death created an opportunity for Wyatt, and he became temporary deputy marshal. Later, Wyatt testified that the shooting was accidental, but Curly Bill still held contempt for Earp because he had pistol-whipped him on the night of the shooting, and Earp made no apologies for his behavior that night. Wyatt Earp had wanted to be elected sheriff. As I stated before, the sheriff collected all the taxes, and Earp had a predilection for not passing along these funds to the proper authorities. In Tombstone, the railroad was the primary taxpayer, and this could have meant thousands of dollars in revenue that the sheriff would have had access to. Then, a stagecoach was robbed, and Earp saw his opportunity to elicit votes. He knew if he could bring in the men responsible for the robbery, he would win the election by a landslide. He contacted Ike Clanton and devised a plan to arrest the men responsible. Clanton was promised that if Earp was successful in collecting the reward money, Earp would turn it all over to Ike Clanton in exchange for his information on the men responsible. At first, Ike agreed, but in time he became paranoid that others would hear of his involvement. Ike feared even Wyatt himself would disclose their agreement, and over time his paranoia only worsened. Ike backed out of the deal, but that didn't clear him of appearing to be a rat to his cowboy friends. When the elections for sheriff took place, Wyatt Earp lost under unexpected and suspicious circumstances. It seemed the cowboys had rigged the election by getting the town's Chinese, who were not eligible to vote at the time, as well as the town children, to cast ballots. They didn't stop there, however. They went around town naming every animal they could find, including burrows and chickens, and then they cast ballots in those names, too. Wyatt's race for sheriff was lost to Johnny Behan, who took his place. Behan was known to be sympathetic to the Cochise County Cowboys, or perhaps he was simply afraid of them. It's been said that Behan was also afraid of Wyatt Earp. The two men seemed to have an interest in the same girl as well. An actress named Josephine Sarah Marcus, or Sadie Marcus, as she was more popularly known. But regardless of the forces at work, tensions were mounting between the two factions of men. Johnny Behan may have won the election, but Wyatt Earp won the girl. Though Wyatt had a second common-law wife named Maddie Blaylock, Josephine Marcus had Wyatt's full attention. Meanwhile, the lines between lawman and outlaw proved very thin indeed. A man named Frank Stilwell was appointed as deputy sheriff by Johnny Behan in April of 1881, but he was fired in August for some accounting irregularities. This small fact is important because Stilwell's name figures prominently later in the story. If all that wasn't enough to rile the Earp brothers, there was the matter of Wyatt's stolen horse, which was missing for nearly a year, which turned up in the possession of Ike Clanton. Doc Holliday, Wyatt Earp, and the newly minted Sheriff Johnny Behan went to collect the horse. 
Though they did so without further drama, Behan was so embarrassed by having to work with Earp and Holiday that he flat out refused to assist them in any further endeavor. The cowboy crime wave, however, continued unabated and culminated in a couple of stagecoach robberies in which innocent men were killed. On September 8, 1881, another stagecoach was robbed. At the scene of the holdup, the Earps found an unusual boot print left by someone wearing a custom-repaired boot heel. Further investigation linked the boot heel directly to Frank Stilwell. But the evidence wasn't enough for the judge, and he threw the case out. Ike Clanton didn't want anyone knowing about his deal with Wyatt Earp. Earp didn't care who knew about it. Now, with the election over, Ike Clanton feared that Doc Holliday may be aware of this secret deal with Earp. Meanwhile, the Wells Fargo Company employed the Earp brothers to ensure safe passage of their coaches. Wyatt didn't care much for the job, but Morgan seemed to enjoy it. While Wyatt and Virgil were testifying against the outlaws in court, Frank McLowry threatened young Morgan Earp's life. He also threatened the lives of the other Earps if they ever tried to arrest him again. This was barely two weeks before the shootout at the OK Corral. In perhaps what could be considered an episode of America's Dumbest Criminals, the Cochise County Cowboys actually wrote letters to Morgan, Wyatt, and finally Virgil Earp, first telling Morgan to quit his job or die, then telling Wyatt to convince his little brother to quit before they robbed the stage, and finally, in their last letter to Virgil, in which they threatened the whole family, they made no secret of their intent to rob the stagecoach. On October 26, 1881, Virgil got word that the Clantons and the McLowrys were armed and had gathered near the OK Corral. The men had been in town all night, drinking and playing cards, and Ike had been vocal about killing the Earps. After weeks of receiving taunts and threats against their lives and months of public humiliation, Virgil requested the assistance of his brothers and Doc Holliday to attempt to disarm the men. Even in those days, it was illegal to carry weapons in public. A city ordinance prohibited the possession of weapons within city limits. Guns were to be checked in at a saloon or a stable shortly after arriving in town. The cowboys had been in town for quite some time, and they were still in possession of their firearms. This city ordinance would become a cornerstone of the Earp's defense in the month-long trial following the shootout. Ike Clanton was drunk and had spent the night playing cards and making threats against the Earps. Ike and the rest of the men had gathered by the OK Corral. They had a distinct advantage here, being close to their horses and rifles, which could easily be brought into battle if the Earps arrived for a showdown. But the Earps were slow to meet the men. In fact, the cowboys began to doubt the Earps would even show up for a fight. So the cowboys left the OK Corral and began to walk their horses through the vacant lot between Fly's boarding house and the Harwood house when they were caught off guard by the Earps, who were just then rounding the corner. Holiday, who had been staying at Fly's boarding house, had theorized the men had gathered there to kill him. This was not complete fantasy, as Ike had good reason for wanting Holiday out of the picture. It was a cold day, and there was said to be snow on the ground. On the way to the empty lot, Virgil traded the short-barreled shotgun he had armed himself with for Doc Holliday's walking stick. Holliday took the coach gun and hid it under his long coat. The idea was to not appear too aggressive when attempting to disarm the cowboys. At the first sign of a conflict, however, Ike Clanton and Billy Claiborne ran off leaving Tom and Frank McLowry and Billy Clanton to stand their ground. Bat Masterson would later say that Ike Clanton begged Wyatt Earp not to shoot him before he ran away. Masterson, however, was not present for the fight. 
Virgil, of course, was not expecting a fight. He testified later that he demanded the men surrender their weapons. When the men drew their guns, Virgil was reported to exclaim, I don't want this. Eyewitnesses claim that more words were exchanged and Doc was the first to open fire. He fired one shot from Virgil's coach gun before dropping it and switching to his own revolvers. In the exchange of gunfire, Tom and Frank McLowry and Billy Clanton all lost their lives. Morgan, Virgil, and Holiday were all wounded during the gunfight, but none of them seriously. Morgan received a wound across his back, Virgil was hit in the ankle, and Doc received a hit in his hip, which later proved to not even be a penetrating wound. Wyatt left the fight without a scratch on him. The gunfight at the OK Corral was over, but Wyatt wasn't ready to quit. On December 27, 1881, Virgil Earp was ambushed and permanently disabled for the rest of his life. Just a few months later, in March of 1882, Morgan Earp was assassinated. He was shot in the back as he played pool as Wyatt and his men watched. Ike Clanton, Curly Bill, and Frank Stilwell were all implicated in the shootings. A half-breed lookout by the name of Florentino Cruz was also accused of being part of this murderous crew. Wyatt was appointed U.S. Deputy Marshal after Virgil was maimed, and he set about to form a posse to ride out after the men responsible. Warren Earp, Fred Dodge, Sherman McMaster, and Turkey Creek Jack Johnson were men deputized by Wyatt Earp to avenge his brothers. And Doc Holliday, of course, was also made part of the crew. After securing his brother Morgan's remains, Earp and his men escorted Virgil and his wife Allie on the train. When they reached Tucson that evening, two men thought to be Ike Clanton and Frank Stilwell were seen lying on flat cars with rifles pointed at the train. Wyatt broke off and slipped between the rail cars in an effort to surprise the cowboy assassins, but they fled as Wyatt approached. The chase was on and the rest of Earp's posse joined in hot pursuit. Soon, Wyatt was found standing over the lifeless body of one of the would-be assassins. Wyatt later claimed that one of the two cowboys had attempted to reach for his gun, and Earp fired both barrels of his shotgun into the assailant. The rest of his posse arrived shortly thereafter, and Doc and the rest of the posse are all alleged to have fired several additional shots into the lifeless form now strewn over the railroad tracks. The dead man was Frank Stilwell. They left him there by the tracks. His body was found the next morning. The Earp Posse continued to search the train yard for Ike Clanton, but they left under cover of darkness, having no luck with their search. Later, a witness would say he heard 10 shots and a group of men cheering. Another witness said of Stilwell, He was shot all over! The worst shot-up man I ever saw! The coroner's jury issued warrants for Earp and all of his posse, stating that each had taken part in the killing of Frank Stilwell. Meanwhile, a telegram was sent to Sheriff Johnny Behan, informing him that his deputy, Stilwell, was murdered, and that he should detain the men responsible. When Behan saw Earp, he requested him to stop, saying, I want to see you. Wyatt pushed right past him, stating, You may see me once too often. Behan, as usual, did nothing to stop the man. The posse again left town to track down another wanted man. This time it was the half-breed known by the name Florentino Cruz, who was said to be a lookout on the night that Morgan Earp had been shot. Florentino tried to flee, but learned the hard way that you can't outrun a hail of bullets. Newspapers would later reveal that the man was wanted for the robbery and murders of two U.S. deputy marshals in 1878. Meanwhile, Earp's posse continued to ride. They were also racking up quite a long list of criminal charges. Sheriff Behan finally decided to take some action, and he rounded up his own posse he set off to stop the Earp's Vendetta ride. Behan's posse was made up of Cochise County Cowboy members Finn Clanton 
and Johnny Ringo, among other men of questionable motives. A second posse of cowboys also set out for the Earps as well. At a place known as Iron Springs, Wyatt Earp and his men were ambushed by a group of cowboys and barely escaped with their lives. In the shootout that followed, Earp heard one of his men call out to a cowboy that he recognized, Curly Bill Brocious, and Earp let loose at the man with his shotgun. The blast nearly cut Curly Bill in two. As a hail of gunfire rained hot lead down upon the Earp posse, Wyatt was certain he'd been struck. Texas Jack lost his horse. The posse fled to safe territory to check their wounds. In the aftermath of the ambush that should have stopped the Earp Vendetta ride right there in its tracks, the men made a miraculous discovery. When they stopped to examine their wounds, they found bullet holes in their coats, boot heels, saddles, and clothes, but absolutely no other injuries besides Texas Jack's horse. The Cochise County Cowboys would later deny that Earp had killed Curly Bill, but the man was never heard from again, leaving little doubt of his death. Though the posse continued to seek their quarry, the Earp Vendetta ride had come to its end. Most of the men wound up in Colorado, where Wyatt's old friend Bat Masterson pleaded with Governor Frederick Pitkin to refuse extradition requests from the Arizona Territorial Authorities. In July of 1882, rumors began to circulate that Earp and or Holiday had killed Johnny Ringo, whose body was found with a single gunshot wound to the head. Holiday had motive, but with a murder charge already hanging over his head in Arizona, it seemed unlikely that he would have crossed state lines to add to his charges, not to mention anything of Doc's health, which was beginning to diminish rapidly. Wyatt later claimed that he had killed Johnny Ringo, but he couldn't get the dates right. The county coroner had ruled Ringo's death was a suicide, and the body was found with a revolver in its hand, with only one bullet fired from the gun. And since Ringo had threatened to commit suicide in the past, it certainly wasn't beyond comprehension that he might have carried out the threat one day. Ike Clanton continued to evade justice. He was shot in June of 1887 while attempting to flee a lawman on charges of cattle rustling. Although Ike's hat had been found at the scene of Virgil Earp's attempted assassination, there was never enough evidence to prove that he was there, as many of his cohorts had provided an alibi for his whereabouts at the time that Virgil was shot. Pony Deal was arrested a number of times for a number of crimes, including cattle rustling and robbery, and he was eventually sentenced to five years in prison at Santa Fe, New Mexico. He escaped in February of 1885, but was recaptured just four days later. He was returned to prison and was finally released in March of 1887. Then, his name disappears from public records. It was rumored he died in a gunfight. In the aftermath of the Vendetta ride, Wyatt, McMasters, Doc Holliday, and Texas Jack remained in Colorado. Bat Masterson was dealing faro, and Earp worked with him for a brief time. Holliday and Wyatt had a serious disagreement over Josephine Marcus when Holliday accused Wyatt of, quote, becoming a damned Jew boy. The two longtime friends parted ways. Holliday drifted off, and the remaining men left for Gunnison, Colorado, where they kept a low profile, camping on the outskirts of town and rarely coming in for supplies. It was here where Wyatt and his men were reported to have pulled a gold brick scam. They tried to sell gold-painted rocks to a German visitor named Richie for $2,000. Wyatt Earp saw Doc Holliday for the final time in the winter of 1886. The two men met in the lobby of the Windsor Hotel. Doc's disease had taken its toll. Josephine described the skeletal Holliday as having a continuous cough and standing on unsteady legs. Doc would die without his boots on just a few months later. Wyatt Earp continued to live in relative obscurity for many years. 
Wyatt was involved in a claim jumping scandal in Idaho, and while the claim of impropriety was made by a man of dubious distinction, the story would come back to haunt Earp in a damaging way. In the meantime, he and Josephine traveled to Texas, then San Diego, where Wyatt would become involved in the real estate boom and managed to do quite well for himself. He owned a saloon which was turning profits as much as $1,000 a night. One of the secrets to Wyatt's success may have been the Golden Poppy Brothel, located on the second floor of his building. He continued his interests in boxing and horse racing. He judged prize fights and owned racehorses. Wyatt had earned a reputation as a sportsman and gambler. He wasn't the only one fond of making a bet, however. For every dollar Wyatt brought home, Josephine gambled it away, and then some. Meanwhile, Maddie Blaylock, who had always considered herself Wyatt's wife, finally asked for a divorce from Wyatt. He refused, but she moved in with a gambler anyway. Maddie Blaylock had been addicted to laudanum throughout her entire relationship with Earp, but she finally overdosed on July 3, 1888. Her death was considered a suicide. Then the San Diego real estate market crumbled soon after. In 1891, Wyatt and Josephine moved back to San Francisco. Josephine wanted to be near her half-sister. Wyatt still owned property in San Diego, but he could no longer keep up with the taxes, and he had to sell the properties. Josephine received an allowance from her family, but she often gambled it away. At one point, Earp had prepared to claim an oil lease in Kern County, which he put in Josephine's name. But instead of filing the claim, she gambled away the lease and the filing fees, then lied about it to Wyatt. The lease later turned out to be quite valuable. Earp feared Josephine was incapable of handling her finances. Earp finally gained national recognition when he was made a referee for a boxing match in 1896, though it was probably not the notoriety he wanted. The fight was between Bob Fitzsimmons and Tom Sharkey and billed as the heavyweight championship of the world. It was alleged that Wyatt had bet on Tom Sharkey, and during the fight, Wyatt claimed that Fitzsimmons had hit Sharkey below the belt, a foul that nobody present had seen. The bad decision and the resulting press made Wyatt Earp a household name, and he was lampasted in newspapers across the country for weeks. Although it's hard to believe today, at the time that this happened, people had not heard of Wyatt Earp, and his storied career in law enforcement was, well, the story hadn't been told yet. Nobody knew anything about the man except for the bad press now circulating. Earp was nearly ruined by this decision, and it haunted him until the day he died. He sold off all his interests and left San Francisco under a cloud of suspicion. Later, it was determined that the fight itself was illegal, and therefore the judge would not officially define a winner. The man responsible for making a medical assessment of Tom Sharkey eventually admitted that he had falsified his report. Reporters had a field day digging up dirt about Wyatt's checkered past. About this time, that old feud over claim jumping in Idaho was rehashed in the press, and Earp's name was further tarnished. He and Josephine left for Alaska in the hopes of making a fresh start. During this time, he met Jack London and befriended the writer. Earp never strayed far from the familiar, however, and soon he was back to his old tricks, dealing pharaoh and operating a brothel. The Earps moved around between Alaska, Oregon, Nevada, Washington, and California before finally settling down in Los Angeles. Once in L.A., Wyatt got busy doing odd jobs for the police force, but these were jobs that were on the outside of the law. His final armed confrontation was the spark of the potash wars of the Mojave Desert. Then, Earp found himself back on the wrong side of the law again. He was fined for attempting to flee someone in a fake pharaoh game. But since the money had not yet changed hands when the arrest was made, the charge was reduced to vagrancy, and Wyatt was released on $500 bail. 
During his time in Los Angeles, Earp became friends with many influential people in the movie industry. He met Charlie Chaplin, Douglas Fairbanks, and famed cowboy actors William Hart and Tom Mix. And he was a frequent visitor to movie sets with director John Ford. It was also alleged he met an unknown prop man looking to make a name for himself as a Western actor. His name was Marion Mitchell Morrison, and he would continue to be unknown until he changed his name to John Wayne. At one point, Earp enlisted the help of his connections, and through William Hart, Earp began developing a biography with a writer named John Flood. During interviews, Josephine would often interrupt the sessions with attempts to control the story. The combination of her outbursts, Wyatt's flair for storytelling, and Flood's flat writing style proved deadly. The resulting book was so poorly written that nobody would publish the work. By the time Stuart Lake began working with Earp, it was very late in Earp's life. Lake was only able to interview Earp eight times before Earp died. He was only interested in writing a magazine article when the two first met, but Earp had been seeking a biographer, and the two agreed to collaborate on a long-form narrative. Earp's failing health and the need for income were primary motivators. Again, Josephine continued to sanitize the work, to the point where she even threatened legal action if Maddie Blaylock was even mentioned. She also saw fit to remove her own name from the record, as she worked to craft a legendary Western superhero out of Wyatt Earp. The book became a bestseller, and a number of movies were influenced by the work as well. Josephine had succeeded in one respect. Earp's reputation had been forever changed. In the 1920s, Wyatt again tried to provide for Josephine, but this time he put the oil leases he owned in the name of Josephine's sister, with the understanding that royalties would be paid to Josephine. However, when the sister died, her children rejected the agreement and no monies were paid to Josephine. Despite their rocky relationship, Earp tried to do right by Josephine. In an article written by Andrew Eisenberg titled The Wyatt Earp Myth, America's Most Famous Vigilante Wasn't, the historian sums up quite nicely what Stuart Lake may have never considered. What follows is an excerpt from this work. The irony that the idealization of Earp as a good guy with a gun, an unswerving servant of law and order, is a myth. As a young man, Earp was arrested for horse theft and consorting with prostitutes. He was run out of a Texas town for trying to sell a rock painted yellow as a gold brick. He was drawn to police work not because of a devotion to the law, but because during the Gilded Age, when public corruption was rampant, it was an easy source of cash. He went to court in 1896 for having refereed a fixed heavyweight championship prize fight, and as late as 1911, at age 63, he was arrested by the Los Angeles police for running a crooked card game. The Earp myth originated not in Hollywood, but with Earp himself, particularly following the 1896 scandal, which was the biggest sports gambling controversy until the fixed 1919 World Series. He became nationally renowned as a flimflam man. Casting around for a way to remake his reputation, Earp stumbled upon Owen Wister's popular 1901 Western novel, The Virginian, in which the hero participates in a gunfight and reluctantly, though necessarily, according to the author, in a vigilante hanging for horse theft. Earp seized on the interpretation. He became a fixture at Hollywood Studios, befriended the early Western silent film stars William S. Hart and Tom Mix, and dictated his Western-inflected memoirs, with the arrest record expunged, several times over the last decades of his life. Like Jay Gatsby or Don Draper, Earp reinvented himself, and he used the newly created film industry as his tool. Earp's story is thus fundamental to American culture, but it is not the story with which we are familiar. It is not about the redemptive power of violence, but the redemptive power of the media. That we know Earp not as a confidence man, 
but as a duty-bound law officer, was his most enduring and successful confidence game. Somebody should make a movie about that. Whether it was Earp, Josephine, Stuart Lake, or the combination of all three, there is no doubt that the name of Wyatt Earp has become the stuff of legends. Whether you choose to believe in Wyatt Earp the man or Wyatt Earp the myth really doesn't matter because either one embodies the unbridled spirit of the wild American West. A multitude of sources were used in researching this material. While every effort has been made to cite these sources and verify facts, some discrepancies may arise. I would like to acknowledge the following resources. Kathy Weiser Alexander and the Legends of America website. The Chronicles of Tombstone by Ben Trawick. The Los Angeles Times. History.com. Biography.com. The Real Wyatt Earp by Steve Gatto and WyattEarp.net. Tom Correa and AmericanCowboyChronicles.com. The Earp Brothers, Wyatt, Virgil, and Morgan Earp by Charles River Editors. Andrew Eisenberg, wikipedia.org. The Drift and Ramble podcast is available on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and just about anywhere else podcasts are found. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and now on patreon.com, where you can find details on how to access exclusive content. As a supporter of our show, you'll get access to exclusive episodes like Bat Masterson talking about Doc Holliday and Wyatt Earp. There are also exclusive photo prints from our travels, like our trip to Bodie Ghost Town. These 11 by 14 prints are made of high quality poster board and are suitable for framing. You can get all the details at patreon.com slash drift and ramble. That's patreon.com slash drift and ramble. Thank you for your support. We love to hear from fans of our show. One way you can really help us out is to leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher. Here are a couple of recent reviews we've received on iTunes. Blue Eyes 12573 says, Fantastic cast, five stars. I love history and great storytelling, and this podcast has them both. I find myself engrossed in the story as the host spins a yarn that comes to life. This show not only educates, but entertains. Big Brother B writes, That intro, five stars. The intro to the show is so freaking great. <laughs> More from the Drift and Ramble podcast after this. There goes old Sally Maples. She's so dumb she couldn't teach a hen to cluck. Her husband ain't so bright neither. He's as dull as dishwater. If all his brains was dynamite, there wouldn't be enough to blow his nose. He is plumb weak north of his ears. He can't tell skunks from house cats. His family tree was a shrub. You boys got nothing better to do than to sit out here and insult everybody that goes by. Oh, hi, Sheriff. We didn't see you standing there. Sheriff, we was fixing to have a smoke, but my matches done got wet, and I'll be damned if I can't light one. You know, instead of sitting outside the general store insulting everybody, you could go inside and buy yourself a hypervape vaporizer. Hypervape is the finest quality made. Why don't you invest in the best? Hypervape.com. That's H-Y-P-R-V-A-P-E. Hypervape.com. The Drift and Ramble podcast is proud to be part of the Pottern family. And you can be part of the family, too. Whether you're a podcaster looking to build your audience and promote your show, or you're a listener looking to find new and interesting podcasts, using the Pottern family hashtag is all you have to do. It's absolutely free to use. Pottern Family is simply a group of dedicated podcasters looking to help people find, listen, subscribe, and review great podcasts. We love our Pottern Family, and we know you will too. And that reminds me to remind you to show some love to the shows you love. If you have a favorite podcast, 
be sure to leave them a review on iTunes or on Stitcher. Nothing makes a podcaster happier than knowing they're appreciated for all the work they do. The Drift and Ramble podcast is a Clear Voice Media production, hosted and produced by Steve Blizzen, with segment research and voice acting by Cheryl Blizzen. Additional contributions and content have been made possible by support from individuals dedicated to the art and science of storytelling and exploring the still fertile promise of the American West. On the next Drift and Ramble podcast, the flood of immigrants into the United States during the 1860s brought all kinds of newcomers and fortune seekers to our shores. Among them was the daughter of a Hungarian doctor who would one day stow away aboard a riverboat headed to St. Louis, Missouri. Apparently, she had a thing for dentists and a big nose, and she would become the common law bride of one of the West's most notorious figures. Her name was Mary Catherine Haroni, but she was known as Big Nose Kate. Next time, it's one for the ladies, as we look into the life and times of one of the wildest women of the West. Until we meet again, I'm Steve Blizzen. See you at the next installment of the Drift and Ramble podcast. <laughs>